one of my mantras is if um if it's meant to be it's up to me there's uh there's nobody that's going to come and you know save us right like heroes are a beautiful thing in storybooks but the reality is we're our own heroes and so if we're not doing it if we're not creating the solution then it's probably not going to happen welcome to hello grow utah's number one growth podcast i'm your co-host court brady i am carlos souza and today we have morgan lemaitre I, and I am just like surrounded by greatness in this room. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we are so pumped to have you. Morgan is the founder of Park City Wealth Advisors, where you have a portfolio. You manage almost a billion dollars in assets. And you have another company that you help other asset managers. And that one also manages almost a billion dollars in assets. You play with a lot more zeros than we are used to. So we're really <laughs> pumped to have you on the podcast today. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. You started your life in probably one of the most difficult things in the pursuit of training for the U.S. figure skating Olympic team. After that, you went and worked as a chef in Thailand and Peru. Then you went to full switch. We got to get into this, yes. but you went from like Peru <laughs> and Thailand curious. in the culinary arts to I'm going to go to Goldman Sachs and then I'm going to come become a certified financial planner. And you went heavy into the financial markets. And then you took the leap to go open your own wealth advisory family office in Park City where you're at today. That's right. OK, we're going to get into all of this. There's a if there's a pattern, can you detect it yet? <laughs> extremes one extreme 180 180 turns <laughs> we're gonna figure it out all right let's do it also you're on a bunch of boards we met on the board of entrepreneurs organization where we both served together and we got to bobsled together i don't know if you know that carlos but that we've is. been bobsledding together and we crushed we beat everyone we're both a little bit competitive so we're going to talk about your journey from Olympics to current, and then we're going to go deep into, I texted you and, and said, we talked to entrepreneurs about something they're passionate about. And you said, I'm very passionate about values, values of my clients, personal values and business values. And so I'm super intrigued of why of all the things that's the one that you wanted to dive into. So we're going to get into it. So awesome. let's start with. Olympics. Like, All right. One clarification okay. point. Yes. I was on the junior world team. Junior world team. You know, Park City, just like, you know, the, you hit Olympians on the running trail all the time. So I don't want to like, you know, piss anybody off. <laughs> the Olympics obviously is every little like ice skating girl's dream. I watched like Tara Lipinski and Christy Yamaguchi and Michelle Kwan. And so, you know, absolutely like when I was training as a little girl, you know, five years old, till when I made the junior world team the first time at 12 years old, like my eyes were on the Olympics. But um, man, skating, figure skating is a tough discipline. Um, Incredibly difficult. And you started when you were five. I started when I was five, yeah. And just um, fell in love with it. It was like all I knew it in my childhood was like tr how to train. And um, like, I think, I think that, like, that's definitely something that like right? It's like still what I look for when I'm recruiting is if somebody was an athlete. Um, but it's really interesting actually kind of living that as a young child, because, uh, I probably wasn't that much fun to be around. I was super serious. You know, <laughs> they like whip you into shape when you're training that many hours a week. What was life like <laughs> as a, an 11 year old, 12 year old training and like, yeah. what was the daily, daily routine? Um, so get up, go to school. My mom would come and get me out of school, at like probably 1145 or 12 o'clock. Um, I'd have like my tights and my dress in the car. I'd change on the way to the ice rink while I was like eating lunch in the car, be on the ice by probably 1230. I'd train for a couple hours on the ice, get off. I'd have a few hours of ballet or off ice or weight training, come home like 745, eight o'clock, make dinner, pack my bag for the next night and go to sleep and do it again. And then Saturdays and Sundays, I was up every morning at 4.30 on Saturdays and Sundays, which means my poor, incredible parents were too, <laughs> um, to drive me to the ring. So I never knew sleepovers, or if I did get invited to sleepovers, I was 
always the one that the girls were picking on because I'd fall asleep on the couch at like 7 30 so I'd wake up at like nine o'clock with like my face painted or they were like doing something horrible to me because girls are so mean at that age and I'd call my mom and like come get me at nine o'clock at night and so like not a like so, that was what childhood was like it was so like all your, about the training is this your mom pushing like go do this Morgan or is this you driving say mom I want to do this yeah, I am incredibly self-driven and put so much pressure on myself. Um, my mom is amazingly supportive. She made all of my skating dresses. She was like, you know, she set the alarm and made sure I was up, but I don't think she ever once had asked me to go to the rink. It was like always something I wanted to do, and I always had goals from a young age. It was always, you know, here's what jump I want to land in the next three months. Here's what spin I want to get. Here's the score I want to get at my next competition. Here's my level that I want to be at. And so just that personal drive combined with I had Russian coaches the whole time and they were so strict, you know, <laughs> combined with them shouting at me from the boards or chasing me around the rink with a stick. So I'd skate faster. Like <laughs> that is all the motivation you need. You just need like a warm hug from your mom when you get off. <laughs> <laughs> and with all that rigor, if you were to go back and do your childhood again, would you change anything or would you do it the same? I don't look back and wish I had done anything different. It is, is this cool. like wildly unique, unlinear path that has gotten me to where I am today. And um, man, I'm just, you know, building the life I, I like have never like um, could never have dreamed of. I was actually sitting with my husband a couple of, a couple of weeks ago. We just finished, you know, building a new house. We've been building it for four years. And uh, we were just kind of sitting out on our deck. And I was like, wow, like. If you had told me when I was, you know, 12, 13 years old that like this would be my life, I never would have believed you. You know, here in this great state of Utah, running a company, you know, getting to show up in uh, my signature cargo pants and T-shirt every day <laughs> out of the out of the suits and, you know, shift dresses of Goldman Sachs. Like it is the coolest thing to be doing you know, married to a man who I love so much and we have like an amazing baby. There's so many hard days, but like, it's such a good life. I have a couple of follow-up questions and one of them is you that said- That was long, that was long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank it's you. Perfect. It's like, it's like the, pa the path of my life, these no, like love twisting. It. We love it. Um, you said that that 13 year old girl wouldn't believe it. I wanna know why do you think that is like why it's so difficult for people either at a young age or early in their careers to have that vision. Um, and second, um, what set of habits and um, beliefs did you build at that time when you're going through that rigorous routine that just blessed you for the rest of your life that, that's still blessing you today? Yeah. Well, I'll start with the first part. So why... Why would I never have believed that as a 13-year-old girl? And it's definitely a loaded question. I think part of it's really simple. It just starts with what you see and what you know. And I've never seen anybody that's doing what I'm doing even now. Um, and so, I, you know, it would have been an impossible dream at the time. But I, I think the other piece is you kind of see what's around you. Everybody that goes into ice skating, that's your, that's your path. You become an ice skating coach or you become a teacher because you're, you know, used to working with a lot of kids. My parents always told me I'd be a really good party planner because I was super organized. So, you know. But you didn't like to party. <laughs> You'd yeah. be on the sidelines planning the I party. I was not like, not yeah. I was really good at getting it teed up and now you're on your own. The yeah, food has been put out. <laughs> I've set up the games, the table is set, bye, <laughs> bedtime. Sounds right? like you need to be the next president of EO. If Brett is gonna listen to this, so Brett just, uh, President elect. And I would hereby elect Corp Brady one more time. <laughs> <laughs> I think he would feed it's, the country. Well, just like it's like a hot potato in this room right now. <laughs> I'm curious on the second question. What what habits and principles, belief sets set you up? Yeah. The one thing that I can look back at today, and, and I've got a pretty vivid memory of this. I was probably 12 or 13 years old and and I was skating at an international team or an international event in Milan, Italy. Wow. And I was skating in a team event. So this was a synchronized skating event. 
And so there's 20 of us on the ice. And if you've ever seen synchronized swimming, it's a lot like that, where you all do the exact same thing at the exact same time. Um, the only difference with synchronized skating is if you mess up, you normally take four or five other girls out with you. So mm. if you fall or trip, like it is a whole thing. You cause a pile up. Um, and you know, so you not only own the fact that you messed up, but you own the fact that you also kind of ruined that experience for all those other people that came down the line after you. And so the one trait that I think I've really carried with me is just an incredibly strong sense of personal accountability. One of my mantras is if, um, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. There's a, there's nobody that's going to come and, you know, save us, right? Like heroes are a beautiful thing in storybooks, but the reality is we're our own heroes. And so if we're not doing it, if we're not creating the solution, then it's probably not going to happen, especially in our business as entrepreneurs, right? Everybody else is looking to us for that. And so if I took away one thing from my, from my skating career or my individual figure skating days, like it's on you as a, as a solo skater, when you fall on that jump and, and, uh, you hear the entire audience go, Ooh, (laughs) which has happened to me so many times. (laughs) Like the only thing you can do is get up like, and get right back in the, in the program, right. As fast as possible. And at the end of the program, you still have to curtsy. You still have to wave to the crowd. And there's like, no, you can't, you can't go back in time and make all those people in the stands unsee what they saw. Like that was on you. I love that. Morgan, there's something you probably, I'm sure you don't know this because I haven't told you, but you were featured in some kind of magazine for Park City or growing companies in Utah or Fast 50 or something. And I read the article. This was almost two years ago. and And you wrote... They asked you a similar question to what Carlos asked, and you wrote, stay humble and be the hardest worker in the room. And I've thought about that so many times, and it's had a positive impact on me. So just thank you for sharing that oh to God. whoever interviewed you a couple of years I ago. I love that. Happy, humble, hardworking. Yeah. So when I've been interviewing, that's like been the three things I look for because I want like a cultural fit. And I'm so, I mean, that means so much to me that that made an impact. And I see that in, in both of you, right? Like we don't have to, just because we've achieved some level of success or we've built something doesn't mean we still can't be the people that, you know, that we've always been our whole life. Um, but my new mantra, oh my gosh, get this. <laughs> I've, ch- I've actually revised it a little. It's passion, helpful, and kindness. Why? Why'd you land on this? We're getting a little ahead of ourselves because we're yeah. going to talk about these values, but I'm curious. This How'd you land on this? Passion, helpful, and kindness. So, so we were at happy, humble, and hardworking, which I think are super, super important and incredible traits. But what I've also found recently is that it's just simply hard to find people that are helpful. Hmm. And that's different than humble and hardworking. Like the desire to help, the desire to serve, that's innate. I, can't, I don't think that can be really taught. And so if you're helpful, and that's really paired with a passion for your craft, like this intense, right, right, like intellectual curiosity, this like desire to learn more and then also kind of show people how they can apply it. That is like, that is a powerful combination. It is so cool if you can find that, that combination of those two things. And then, you know, if you kind of layer kindness on top of it, that's a, that's a trifecta that, uh, that I'd want to be around every day. I'm so stoked. We're going to jump through some of your life stuff because I'm so yeah. pumped to get this because there's this capitalistic view in the world where you have to be hard-nosed and unhelpful and look out for number one. And kindness is nice, but let's not actually do that. Let's be cutthroat. Like You need to have a killer instinct. And you're managing almost billions of dollars. And you have a very different playbook, very different value stack than that mainstream capitalistic what's shown on the media approach. And I want to get into that. I do want to hit on how you ended up in Thailand, though, and how you ended up in Peru. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, walk us through. Oh, man. How did you even get it? Was it Thailand or Peru first? It was Thailand. So, um, okay, so after years of, like, intense training, I think I had touched a little bit on that, like, I was a very serious child. And so when I went back to high school, my competitive skating career stopped when I was about 16. I started to grow. So if you're watching this podcast, you probably can't tell that I'm almost six feet tall. Um, at the time when I was ice skating, they keep you so small. You're ballerina small. 
you know, they kind of delay puberty as long as possible. You're training hard. And so once I started to grow, my center of gravity, like started getting further and further away from the ice. And, you know, very simply, like it hurt to fall. <laughs> it was a long way down. <laughs> and so after enough of, you know, after enough times being that black and blue, you're kind of like, okay, like, you know, this has been an amazing run. I've loved the sport for what it gave me, but like, you know, maybe it's time to like turn a new, a new leaf in the page. Um, and so I, you know, did different, I still love ice skating coached for a long time, but the reality is it was getting really hard on my body. Um, and so I really started winding down from competitive figure skating and, and, I think my last year on the U S junior world team was when I was probably 14 or 15. And, um, and so then I, I had to go back to school. Like I didn't get out of school anymore. I didn't miss six weeks of school anymore. So I had to like go to real high school for the first time. (laughs) And that was eye opening. I mean, the girls were mean at 12 and 13 and high school was like (laughs) full-time school for the first time is like a kind of a weird kid. That's just like, you know, always had their name on billboards, like, you know, that you were competing and they'd like seen me in the newspaper, but like then to have to go integrate with these, you know, really immature teenagers was (laughs) not a good fit for me. (laughs) And so I made it through high school. It was tough. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, Like, and I just thought, I was like, why are the kids in this class not listening? We could get this math assignment done in half the time if they would just be quiet and listen to the teacher instead of goofing off. (laughs) Like, (laughs) high school is a tough experience. And I was like, there is no way I'm going to go sit with these immature monkeys in college. (laughs) Like, I can't do four years of this. This is Animal House. Like, (laughs) And so, you know, probably like, oh my God. So I, I actually sat down with my uh, therapist at the time and my parents and was like, I am going to be deferring from college. Don't talk me out of it. I have already (laughs) applied to culinary school. I know that's where I need to be. And, uh, you know, their jaw was definitely on the ground. I was like, but it's a deferment. It's fine. But I've already gotten in. I'm going to go to classical French cooking school. And, um, and so, you know, what are you going to do at some point, you know, we all have kids, luckily ours are like little, so like they still do what we tell them. But, but I think if you're listening, you probably know that inflection point in your life where like your parents really don't have a choice anymore. It's just like, okay, (laughs) well, (laughs) there's that. (laughs) What are we going to tell our friends? I can't wait for this moment. (laughs) What are we going to tell our friends? I can't wait for this moment. We always talk about, oh, Henry's going to go into mill modeling. (laughs) Adley will be the CEO. Henry will go into mill modeling. (laughs) So I can't wait for that conversation. Oh my God. Right. Like my husband always says like, you could try to keep your kids in like in the lane, but like, you know, they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. You're just a bumper. Yeah. <laughs> you just try to keep them kind of on a course. Um, <laughs> so there I went, I packed up my, I called my parents. I'm like, I'm coming home, came home to Chicago. I'm going to need a car. Cause I'm going to culinary school and it's in Vermont and they have a lot of snow on the roads there. So, uh, I show up my parents had like traded in my Honda civic for, uh, like a, a Subaru Forester with a stick shift. I like, I had to learn how to drive stick shift from Chicago to Vermont, which <laughs> meant, basically meant like I didn't stop because I didn't know if I was going to be able to start the car again. Don't get on any like, incline. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I stopped for like gas once and it was like, you know, if you've ever driven stick, it's like, choo-choo, choo-choo. like until yeah. you can like figure out how to get out of the parking lot. Um, show up in Vermont at New England Culinary Institute. And, uh, it was an amazing transition for me because it was so disciplined. It was like going back into the world of sport. We had our brigade checked every single morning, which is the, your kitchen uniform, right? Your white shirt, your checkered pants, your hat, everything had to be ironed. The creases had to be in the right spot. The shoes had to be polished. And I spent six months learning how to make stocks and sauces and, like how to dice an onion and dice carrots and make mirepoix. Um, and it was so fascinating because this was one of the first times in my life that I'd always been around a lot of adults and I didn't really get along with my 
you know, I, I think I was just so high strung at that point. I couldn't find common ground with my peer group yet. <laughs> and so, you know, we talk about humble. Oh my God. Culinary school was humbling because there are people from every walk of life. There was, you know, the ones who had worked in kitchens forever and, you know, swore like sailors, drank like sailors, had tattoos all over and like were trying to perfect their craft. There was ex-military who, you know, needed something simpler or a simpler life who just came to learn how to make bread. Um, you know, there was high school dropouts. And then there was, you know, people like me who told their parents or their therapist that they were going to go, you know, <laughs> if nothing else, throw great dinner parties. <laughs> so I got chewed up a little in the kitchen. There is no doubt. <laughs> but uh, that hard work came through. And so I think like eventually like we all found some common ground and, you know, it was uh, these people I went to culinary school back then are still some of my like best friends today. What, uh, what are some of the lessons that you learned from your time at that culinary school, your time in Thailand, and your time in Peru? So, and how did you end up in Thailand? Yeah, you still want to know that story. <laughs> what is a that. good story? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can tell this one on this podcast. <laughs> oh. Okay, we absolutely have to hear this <laughs> yes. story. If you regret later, we can cut it out. Have but. you ever heard of a fake ID? <laughs> <laughs> we need to hear it. <laughs> So, you know, culinary school is a lot of fun. We had like, you know, you start to develop a palate for wines and in Vermont, you can, you know, you can bartend when you're 18. The rules are different or were different in Vermont in those days. And so on the weekends, we'd go out to restaurants and bars, right? Part of the hospitality experience. We wanted to see like how it was all run. And at this point, you know, my new, like my eyes are open. I'm like, oh my God, there are all different types of people in the world. Like this is so much fun getting to know them. And, um, and so I would just like go out and talk to everybody. And so one weekend I'm, I'm in some bars in Stowe, Vermont and, um, you know, I'm, I'm chatting with these guys and they run a Thai restaurant and they're like, and I'm like, I love Thai food. They're like, come to the restaurant, like come work in the kitchen. And I was like, great. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I've just put in like a full day at school, but like, I'm like obsessed with hospitality at this point, every piece of it. And so I go into the kitchen and, and I'm watching them. I really vividly remember them taking Wonder Bread and they take a piece of Wonder Bread in one hand and they scoop ice cream and they put, you know, a scoop ice cream in the middle and then they put the other piece of Wonder Bread on top and pinch the edges and they drop it in the deep fryer and they pull it out and cover it in powdered sugar, put it on a plate, call it fried ice cream and serve it for $20. <laughs> And I was like, wow. <laughs> Someone what? making machine. I've been dicing onions for the last eight months. So I just eat Wonder Bread and ice cream. Right? And I'm like, at a Thai restaurant, I'm just like, what? Like, there are a million different ways to do this craft. <laughs> um, and so I was just like, you know, jaw on the ground. Like, my hands are on my cheeks. And I'm like, oh, I want to see everything else you do back here. Like, what else are you making in this kitchen? <laughs> and so uh, I'd go and help and was like this great free labor and uh, they'd let me like pitch in I would like go back I'd make myself dinner like I don't know why these people would let me just walk back into their kitchen it's so, so weird yeah <laughs> and so at some point I go up to them and I'm like guys I'm really sorry like I don't think I'm gonna be able to come in uh like help anymore I've got to find an internship part of the program is you do six months of school and then a six month internship and um and they're like oh well what what are you doing and i'm like i'm not sure yet like i've been exploring some things out of the broadmoor in colorado um but i haven't found like i haven't found the internship yet and the one of the guy that's running this restaurant at the time he said well why don't you know we're going to thailand in three weeks why don't you come with us no and way. um i'm like well what would i do and he's like well my dad is the personal assistant of the king of thailand so maybe you could come and cook for him. <laughs> and, and I'm like, cool, that sounds fun. Like, sign me up. In hindsight, weird story. I remember like calling my parents like, yeah, so I'm gonna go to Thailand like with these guys and their flight attendants just, uh, or their, you know, their travel agent, she's gonna send me a, yeah, she's getting me a ticket and so no big deal, I'm gonna meet him in JFK in three weeks and we're just gonna go over together. Like, 
Your parents are like, <laughs> like have you why seen did the they movie let Taken? me go? <laughs> <laughs> to this day, it is one of the biggest head scratchers. Do you scratchers. know who Liam Neeson is? <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you are like this, like, like scrawny 18 year old girl who is like, right, like, has lived, but like, it's also been a life where like when I traveled, I had my team manager, my doctor, my coaches, like there was no playing out of the lines. Like I'm like, what? When I look back on this, why? What? <laughs> <laughs> that is weird. But uh, yeah, it sounded like a great idea to my non frontal <laughs> lobe developed, my non developed frontal lobe, 18 year old mind. <laughs> So I was like, done, let's do it. <laughs> and you're encouraging every 18-year-old that has not developed that frontal lobe to say, yeah, if it sounds good and feels good, let's do it. I'm all in because of how your life has ended up. Yeah, I have, I have like got some angels looking out for me. <laughs> oh my God. What? It's crazy. So you end up in Thailand. Are you... Who, you, so, who do you end up cooking for? Oh man, this is wild. So I end up in Thailand and... Um, and we're kind of like traveling around when we first get there. I don't speak the language. I'm like, when am I going to go to work? And they're like, well, we're going to travel first. I was like, all right, but like, shouldn't I like, don't I have to go to work? <laughs> first we travel. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we actually spent six weeks traveling with like the entire Bangkok police entourage and like, <laughs> like, oh, cause you're with the King of Thailand. Cause we were with like his, the, the staff. sons of the staff. And, oh my God. and so like we go all over Thailand, like to all these religious ceremonies. We go out to these big dinners. Like it was wild. Six weeks later, I'm like, I'm a little uncomfortable with this one. I'm like, all right, this has been so fun. But like, you know, my type A personality, I have 700 internship hours to complete in the next six months. Like, when do I get to work? <laughs> <laughs> you can't turn it off. You, you just are you that way. <laughs> and um, so eventually I, I go to work. I, I work at the Grand Ayutthaya Hotel, which uh, the king has a pretty robust real estate portfolio. And so I was working in uh, one of his hotel's kitchens. And, um, oh my gosh, wow, another really interesting experience. The first day I show up, they give me my uniform. Everybody speaks Thai. They told me a lot of people speak English in the kitchen. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and all they know about Americans is that we really like to eat cereal. And so they like put me down on this like wood bench and they bring me over some cocoa puffs. <laughs> <laughs> With some lukewarm milk? Yeah, like because they don't, they can't even drink milk there. <laughs> it's like what? To say this is what you get to prepare for everyone that comes to the hotel. <laughs> for Welcome sure. to seven hundred hours of cereal prep. <laughs> cereal prep. Oh my gosh. So you know, just another wildly humbling experience. It's pretty low on the totem pole in Thailand to work in a kitchen. Uh, I had to buy rain boots my my second day on the job because the kitchen would flood every other wow. day. You'd open the cabinet drawers and rats would come out. Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was just a wild ride. I spent a lot of time learning how to carve watermelons in the back, and <laughs> I made a lot of stir fries. <laughs> how did you end up going from Thailand? Did you go straight to Peru from Thailand? No. So after working in Thailand, I came back to school and did n another six months at culinary school back in Vermont. This time they pulled us out of the stocks and sauces, the mirepoix. We were supposed to take everything we had learned from our internship. And we were real world preparing and working in the back of the kitchens. And so we actually ran a restaurant at culinary school. Cool. And, um, and then from there, this was like 2008, very big Thai Peruano fusion. I was kind of exploding, like the use of Thai chili peppers and fish sauce and foods was really like all the rage and so they were starting to put it into ceviche and ceviche was becoming mainstream which is a big peruvian food and um and so i had a another internship opportunity job offer down in lima peru and i feel like i'm watching a movie like yeah. i've seen this in the movie it's really weird i know you need to you know and it's, and it's hard right now at this point you've got to top thailand so you're like oh, you i can't that? just go to chicago <laughs> <laughs> gotta say yes and then uh yeah ended up in peru you know that per peru was not the experience thailand was it was, uh, this was my first experience with an employer who really kind of sells, sells a bill of goods. And I don't know if you guys have ever been here. I feel like we all have at our young age where they kind of make this promise to you with what you're going to get paid, what the job is going to look like. And you show up, they realize they've kind of got you 
and it is totally different terms. Mm -hmm. And and that happened to me in Peru. It was a big, it was just a big learning experience. You know, I showed up. The employer was completely different than the person that I'd interviewed with. It, you know, they had advertised that it was a paid position. It was unpaid. Um, you know, the kitchen, another situation where nobody spoke English. Luckily, I had some working Spanish. But it was just long, long days in a, you know, in a, in a very different environment than I thought I was showing up to. Why'd so, you stay? How long did I you stay? I had 700 there? hours. Court. <laughs> 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 this was it. You know, you, I was there. I had to get it done. Um, <laughs> wow. But, you know, it was also about, you know, and, and, even though somebody didn't keep the commitment to me, I, you know, I always believe in showing up and keeping the commitments I've made if it's within reasonable bounds. Right. And so. So you go from Thailand, Peru, French school, Chicago, driving your stick shift to Vermont, and then you go back to your parents' house and say, hey, guys, I no one longer want to do culinary school and be a chef. I want to go manage mass amounts of money. So I'm going to Goldman Sachs and then I'm going to go get my CFP. No way. Okay, no way was I surprising again? them again. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to know after I had already got where I needed to go. <laughs> That's the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Learn my lesson. <laughs> this was going to be a pleasant surprise this time. <laughs> so I actually went back to Chicago. I finished my bachelor's degree. I have a degree in international hospitality management. Um, and I worked front of the house for a while doing F&B management. I actually ran some bars one summer in Vermont at a club called the Basin Harbor Resort. And I realized pretty quickly there, and this, I don't know, this might sound horrible, but I realized, oh my God, if I am going to work this many hours, this hard for this little pay, maybe I should be doing something different because I, at this point in my life, I've never been at the party because I've either fallen asleep or not been invited because I was so type A and so unfun growing up, you know, that new chapter, like, I don't want to be working the party for the rest of my life. I want to be at the party. And, um, and so, you know, that was kind of, and that's right. One of the layers. The other is that as much as I love hospitality, there is nothing more fun than working uh, 10 hours in the kitchen. It goes by so fast. You come home, you're exhausted you know, it was fun. You were with your friends. You got to joke behind the line. Like, but it, it, for me, it wasn't very, it wasn't mentally stimulating in the way that I had hoped. Um, it accomplished a lot of the things that I loved. I always, I loved making people happy. You know, there's nothing that feels better than, you know, serving somebody an incredible meal and seeing the look of joy on their face or the community that's brought together through great meals, through breaking bread together. And, um, and so I knew that I wanted those pieces in my life still. I wanted community. I wanted to serve. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. I just didn't know how to do it at that time. And so it was, you know, part of the journey was figuring out, well, how do I do that on a bigger level? How do I help and serve and, and create community? And that was what actually led me into finance. Yeah. So what was the first step? The first step was studying a lot. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, yeah, I spent six months locked in a room and, uh, while I was finishing my bachelor's degree, studying for my series seven, my series 65, all of my FINRA and uh, FINRA licensing exams. And so I don't know if you know this, but to work in finance, it, you know, it's great to have an economics degree, right? It's great to have a financial background, but what you need is you need to pass your securities exams. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to working, you know, in law. You yeah. don't have to go to law school, but you need to pass the bar. Mm -hmm. And so I studied. I read that book. I read the Baron Series 7 book probably six times and made flashcards. Like, I read every book on economics I could find. And, um, and then I actually passed my exams, went to UBS, and was like, please hire me. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, please. Like, um, and man, somebody took a chance on me and I don't know why they took a chance on me, but, uh, you know, was a young girl with a hospitality degree who had, you know, somehow passed these exams and, uh, and they took a chance on me and gave me my first job as a sales assistant at UBS. And man, once I was in the door, I freaking loved this industry. I knew that was exactly what I was meant to be doing. Jump to the end of that 
what caused you to take the leap and go and start your own thing? Oh, so many things. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, so I worked at UBS, I worked at Goldman, I worked at the best names in the world. And what I really struggled with working at these incredible names that I was so proud to be a part of was that I didn't feel like they were actually doing what was best for the clients. I didn't feel like they were actually giving their clients the best advice. And so it was super hard for me to sit in that role, feeling like I was sitting on my hands, wondering why nobody would talk to their clients about taxes or why they wouldn't talk to them about legal structure. I was doing, uh, I was working on, I was underwriting a deal at Goldman at, at the time and, and there was these young guys who were having an exit out of their company and they took everything in restricted stock they had an enormous tax bill they couldn't pay because they had zero liquidity because nobody was advising them along the way that maybe they should have taken some of that in cash, right? Or negotiated a, a, a shorter lockup period. Um, maybe they should have done some gifting beforehand. Maybe they should have taken a lower valuation in exchange for not having a seven-year non-compete with that restricted stock mm -hmm. and been able to use their human capital and go out and build something again. And I just couldn't believe that the best firms in the world were sitting here trying to quote unquote help the brightest minds in the world not be able to keep building and creating that felt like a crime to me and so i knew i wanted to do something different because i wanted to help people who were willing to go out in the world and take risk right like put their like risk everything they had to create something and build something that they thought that would make that that they believed would you know make the world better or that they believed in right and um i wanted to help those people be able to do that in a really effective way in a way where they didn't have to experience the pitfall for the first time every single time. You know, and so I wanted to provide those resources at my firm where we could talk through, you know, why you should do something differently, why you should set up trust for your family, you know, why you should have life insurance for your family. These founders become so tunnel vision focused on what they're building and what their passion and their craft is, everything else goes away. There's no time to think about anything else on right in the wings. We've been working through this process, <laughs> yeah. like, talking through mine, and I'm like, we're gonna literally have no time at all to figure out what to do with like financial planning. It's yeah. just going in to figure out this next thing. It's true, and you're not like there's so many people in the same boat as you, and it and it's as somebody that now has been in finance for a really long time. It's so scary to watch because a lot of times these people that are willing to take risks that they're so they have this passion, right? They also have young families. And for as many of these ideas and companies that succeed, there's just as many that don't. And, you know, it could be the best idea in the world. And just because of outside factors, like something happens, right? And then there's these people with families and they don't have a landing zone. It's a, you know, this, this idea, this billion dollar idea is a zero and there's no money in the bank account to even, you know, be able to pay the mortgage. And that's devastating. Like as entrepreneurs, we need to protect each other because this is a this is a rare breed of people that's willing to go out and, and risk, right? Risk their lives, risk the time that they have to spend with their families, um, risk their own capital. They're normally putting in their mom and dad's capital too into their companies. And so how do we create landing zones? How do we leverage other assets or outside resources that aren't all our own for the greater good? And, and if so, anyone's listening to this, Morgan LeMaitre, Park City Wealth Advisors, is your shop. <laughs> yeah, come talk to us. Like we, I just like, I love this. And, and what I love so much about our business is that we're just able to work with people who are building something pretty cool and are equally as passionate about their mm. craft. Yeah. And so, man, we were talking about it earlier, right? Passion, helpful, kindness. Like That's a perfect segue. So of all the things we could have asked that you could have chosen, why was values the thing that stood out to you of, yeah, I want to spend some time talking about that? Um, oh my gosh. I just feel, why is values? Because I think values is, is the driving force or should be the driving force between, for, of, of every decision we make in our lives. And so whether it's our investment accounts, right, that's an easy thing to talk about. It's what I do all day long. So when a client comes and sits down with me and, and we start talking about their investments in the old way of doing things or how other advisors do things is they talk about it. Well, what kind of returns are you seeking? Right. And, and that's great. We all want to make money and 
you know, and there's plenty of that. That's, that's an easy thing to do, actually. What's not easy is to take a step back and to have the conversation, well, what purpose will this serve? You know, what difference does it make if we make 10% on $100 million or if we make 15% on $100 million? How would your life change tomorrow? What would you do differently? You know, what's the intention behind, you know, it, what's this money going to do? And so for a lot of my clients, they have had tremendous exits. And then they're faced with a decision about, well, they, they almost feel an obligation. They need to give money to their kids. Hmm. And um, they feel like, well, I have, I have success now. Now I need to go and like, you know, I need to go and, you know, set up trust funds. And so the values piece of what we do is a lot about the intentionality of what, we're, what the end result is that we're trying to achieve. So as you're going through this process with these founders or entrepreneurs or people who have had a mass amount of money that they need to invest and you're digging, do you do they know their value set? If you just say, hey, tell me your values and let's align your investments with your values, or do you have to help them articulate what their values are? Yeah. we Most people cannot articulate their core values. Are you guys able to? I can, yeah. All right, come on, Court. Mine, mine is love, build, be. Mine. That's amazing. That's incredible. So I'm in the process of redoing mine, but the one that I, the ones I built a few years ago are integrity, hard work, and faith. I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> so this is a this is rare. Most people are not able to articulate their core values, and they also are kind of led or being pushed by what they feel that society is expecting of them, and what they think society is expecting them to do. Mm-hmm. When you know, the reality is, you know, that, that piece probably isn't irrelevant. A lot of societies actually not probably not doing it right. They're doing the best they can, but it's often because they don't know another way. And so one of my favorite kind of ideas or concepts to work with our clients on is, Hey, whatever it is that you believe, you know, here's some, here's some kind of basic framework, you know, by the time your kids leave the house, they should know what to expect, what not to expect and what's expected from them, right? And so this idea that there can be transparency and expectations laid out. A lot of times people get weird with money. Mm -hmm. And so we can't even begin to talk about values because the parents are so worried about like either trying to hide it or trying to show it. Mm -hmm. And neither of those two things need to be true. Um, Another thing we often talk about before we even get to the values is what a parent's role actually should be in a kid's life. And it's funny, right? Because it's so quick that the conversation changes from investments. But, but these are the things that we need to talk about that really drive what the investments can and should be doing and, and where they should be invested, right? Should we be investing in startups? And does it matter to us if the startup actually ever makes a return? Um, should we be investing in companies that you know, support America's defense? And why? Is that aligned with our values and us as a family? And so kind of distilling it down to these conversations even far before that help us get to some of those answers. Um, But I think one of the most powerful things that a lot of the families we work with kind of walk away with is this idea that a parent's job isn't necessarily to give wealth or to hand wealth over. A parent's job is to, by the time a kid leaves the house, to teach them how to swim, right, how to fish, and the word of something greater than themselves. And so if we can accomplish those three things as parents, then we can really lay the groundwork and the framework to have conversations about what happens next. At what point in your life did you real? I was reading, uh, I was also reading an article and uh, I think they asked you a question, um, what do you attribute your success to or something like that? And then you said doing the right thing every time, um, which kind of aligns with what we're talking about here, your values, right? When did, when did you realize that that was the key, the key, when, when did you realize that that was the most important thing? You know, I actually remember the exact moment. So it was one of the, it was when I was working at Goldman and when you're working in finance, there's a lot of, um, Oh, what's the right word I'm looking for? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, I don't know. It's like, um, what's the word? It's like, um, uh, like you're encouraged. Like it's, it's not like good. It's like, no, but like you're like incentivized to like do, uh, the wrong thing. Um, negative pressure. Well, let's just, let's just call with, uh, so, so at Goldman, I think in, in finance in general, there's, there's kind of an abundance of greed, 
right? And so people are kind of driven by greed or led by greed to not necessarily make the right choice for other people, but often the right, they make the right choice for them. Um, or they make a choice that might be easier in the short term than the long term. And so, you know, a very simple example of that is when we'd make a mistake at, at Goldman Sachs, they'd have a phone call to debrief it. And you would have to get on the phone with all the managers and talk about why you made the mistake and what went wrong and, you know, what you were going to put in place so that it didn't happen again. And I remember being on this call and I was so used to like, you know, always wanting to have this team mentality. Like, and so I was like, well, we did this and we did that. And they're like, no, use the word I, this is on you. What did you do wrong? <laughs> right. And, and so I remember being like, oh, okay, well, I, you know, forgot <laughs> to add the language on, you know, whatever this remit was at the time. As a result of me not adding the language, I caused this to happen. And, and it was really interesting. It was like eye opening for me because I was like, wow, I have a choice and I have a, like a decision to make with how I'm going to approach and be in this industry, right? How I'm going to show up when something doesn't go right. And so I made the decision at that point in my career that I wanted to look back on my career and always be really proud of the choices that I made. And so a lot of times the choices in finance in our industry, they're definitely to do the right thing is not the easy thing. Um, but that's, that's a short term win to do the right thing. Even when it's the hard, hard thing, that's, that's the long term win. And so I knew that there was going to be a lot of temptation in this industry. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and that I never wanted to be somebody that fell, you know, victim to temptation that I wanted to be able to tell my kid, my grandkids, the story one day of the career I had, whatever that career looked like. And I wanted to be really proud of it. And so, man, that's, you want to like kind of remind yourself of that every day. Like, how do I have a story I'm really proud to tell my grandkids? That's standing up and doing the right thing every day, even when it's the hard thing. I love that. What's the end result when somebody makes choices in business with large sums of money, whether it's their own business or someone else's money, that's misaligned with their value set? What, so what, what when happens? someone lives incongruous with their value set, what are some of the side effects of that? They'll never find contentness. They'll always be searching for more. I think that's your greatest pitfall. You'll never find, you'll never be happy. There's never a return that's going to satiate your need to, you know, to, to either seek higher returns or find the next new shiny investment or tool or, I mean, a simple example is, you know, when somebody has, I mean, this is actually a real stat. Most entrepreneurs within the first nine years after they've had a payout, they have, they have 10% of their wealth left. Um, it's 90% of their wealth is gone in the first nine years. And that's because they don't have a value focus. Everything looks like a good deal. And so, you know, outside of values, you've heard of founder syndrome. You think you have a Midas touch. You've had one good exit. I can do it again. No problem. <laughs> Investing is the same thing. And so, you know, having value sets to align around really help avoid that. And they help keep us on our mission and driven with purpose. When people lose purpose, when they're building a company that's purpose isn't, you know, rallying around their passion, it's not successful. Those are the first companies that die are companies whose purposes aren't aligned with their passions. And so having a value set aligned around everything you do, think of, think of it as a lens, right? If I were to put a lens in front of a decision and say, will this help me continue to be, you know, helpful, kind, passionate, does this still fulfill, fulfill these three objectives? If we use that as a lens for every decision we made, would we be able to walk away whether it was a good outcome or a bad outcome and feel good about it? You know, the answer more often than not is yes. If we don't use those lenses and we're making decisions, you know, are we going to be happy or fulfilled when things go south? You know, probably not. I'm just going to take, take a second to digest that. It's giving me so many thoughts and reflections of my own life. So thank you. You're welcome. For sharing that. Are there any success stories that you can share with the audience as that you helped an entrepreneur or a wealthy person find their values and the difference that made in their lives are there any success stories that you can share yeah absolutely 
All right. Let me think about which one I want to share. Cause there's so many, um, you know, let me, let me, um, God, there's just so many, but I think one of my favorite ones is, um, I have a, I have a couple businesses that I work for in their family businesses. And these family businesses, before we started working together, they always felt like they needed to give every family member a role within the business and they needed to give them, they need to put them on payroll. And they would have, they would, they would see a lot of attrition with the employees that weren't family members because they'd feel really unfulfilled. You'd have all these family members in there. They weren't as qualified as they were, um, that didn't care about the business the way that they did, but it was the easy way to get paid, right? They, these younger family members coming in felt like it was their obligation and their duty, um, you know, that they had to go into the company instead of the, this idea that they got to go in the company. And so when I worked with this particular family, we took a step back and we were like, Hey, what, like, what are we robbing the next generation from? Hmm. And when we started talking about values and really understanding the, the founder, the matriarch and the patriarchs of this business's story, we found that the things they were proud of most was their ability was was their ability to bring this company back from the brink when you know when they had to sell their car to make payroll, right? And we've we've probably have heard different iterations of that story before, mm-hmm. but um, you know their wins felt the greatest because they knew where it had come from, and so when we heard this story, you know, as a kind of as a family sitting here, we were able to s- distill it down to the fact that they were potentially robbing the next generation from having those moments of pride, right? Those stories to tell their grandchildren or their next generation of the the moments that they were most proud of in their life, because they would never have the opportunity to achieve great success or to achieve failure. Um, They always had that safety net. And so what this family started doing as a result of these conversations about values was they asked their kids to go out into the workforce and work for five years at a different company to learn from somebody else, to learn what governance looks like somewhere else. And if they still wanted to, after that period of time, they could come and apply for the role back at the company. And what this family saw was a dramatic increase in happiness and family relationships, a dramatic decrease in the number of family members that actually (laughs) wanted to come in and work in the business, profitability went up, and employee retention got higher as well. Um, And so for that family, you know, I think it's one of my favorite stories because we shaped the trajectory for not just the family members in there to allow them to do something that they actually loved with their life, not something that they had to do with their life. And we helped redefine what that story looked like for the people that weren't family members working in the business, that they could actually work at a place where they felt like, you know, they were, they meant something, right? Their values were recognized and they were real contributors. So that was a that was a pretty cool uh, family to be involved in. You brought two things to mind. One, this concept of choosing the short term hard to make the long term easy, and they're for sure doing that, and I'm for sure guilty of that often. <laughs> and the second one is that the right answer is usually in the nuance, not the extreme. Like you have this extreme extreme of yeah, they're my child, so of course they get a job. Or, yeah, I'm not going to give my money to the government, so I'm going to give it all to my children as much as I can. Or I had to bootstrap from the beginning, and I had to walk uphill both ways, and so I'm not going to give my child a penny. And the much more difficult decision, but I don't want to put it on anyone else if this is the decision that you make, but the best, the highest value-adding decision is probably somewhere in the middle of those to be able to cognitively go through the process and say, what decision aligns with my value set that's in between. Absolutely. That's a hard thing to do. I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and one of the things that I think makes it so hard is a lot of times people don't know how to have that conversation Hmm. and it can be uncomfortable. Right. And so again, this idea that, you know, the, the right thing isn't necessarily the easy thing. There's some uncomfortable conversations when we start talking about what we believe in and why we believe it. Um, it's much easier not to talk about it, right? Sometimes it's easier just to write the check and give it to your kids. Um, and that it's not necessarily right or wrong, right? Depending on who the kid is, but there's there's different ways to do it. And that's what's really fun is having the conversation and then at least you know families can decide. Maybe they were doing it the right way or the way they wanted to the whole time. 
maybe there's a different way or a way that could help, you know, allow the next generation to really experience or, or to have great pride in what they do in their life. Can I ask you a difficult question? Sure. What if somebody's natural value set does not align with the natural principles that govern wealth creation? That they just want to give all their money away? Whatever it is. If I want to be kind at the expense of profits or I want to love at the expense of profits or I want whatever, fill in the blank at the expense and long-term success of business profits, but there's this misalignment and the, the laws that govern wealth creation are there. And if you adhere to them, you will generate wealth. And Uh if you ignore them or live in contrary to them, you will lose wealth. So what happens if your value set does not align with the natural laws of nature? My my personal opinion is there's always a way to kind of find alignment. And so maybe we're looking for alignment in the wrong ways. You know, it's just this, it's, it's, we could relate it to something a little bit simpler, like this idea of giving. I really wanted to go into the Peace Corps when I was 18. I thought the most honorable thing in the world would be somebody that goes out and gives. And it is a noble thing to go into the Peace Corps. As a single person, you're able to help other people. You know, or, you know, in, in my role, I still I continue to have that same desire. I want to help people. Right now, and what I'm building through my company, one day I'm going to be able to help a lot of people in a way more meaningful way. Um, and, and, and maybe meaningful is the wrong word. We should cut that out actually. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, you know, in my role now, I'm going to be help, I'm going to be able to help people on a, on an even bigger scale, right? Because of the foundation I'm creating to, to be able to give, not just to whoever I can go and meet with face to face, but through my role with individual families and through my role with advisors and the families they're serving. So my reach is expanded. And so I don't know that one has to jeopardize the other. I think sometimes maybe we just need to find alignment in a slightly different way. Work it, massage it, figure out where that alignment is if it's not there on the surface level. Yeah. And if it's not there on the surface level, maybe that's just our, uh, you know, our cue to keep looking, to look a little harder. This has been amazing for me. So you've added so much value, significant value. Thank you, Morgan. Oh my God. Thank you both so much for having me in this room. The energy has just been amazing. And I can't wait to see what you both build next. Well, we'll keep uh, reading your articles and following your journey and learning from you. Thanks, Morgan. So the last question before we wrap up is you get to choose which version in the timeline of your life which version of Morgan you're sitting across from. So I want to know which version of Morgan you're sitting across from in the timeline. Is it finishing up ice skating? Is it on your, while you're in Chicago? Is it while you're at Goldman Sachs? Which version you're sitting across from and what advice you give yourself? Okay, I love this. I'm going to go with, I'm sitting across from Morgan, who's the figure skater. And... Um, 16 year old 16 years old still struggling to find my voice my purpose my you know I I had a passion but it's hard as an athlete when you start to leave your sport you lose your identity and um and so I was still struggling to find my voice and so my advice to to her to that Morgan would be never be so polite that you lose your voice um I was raised to be you know to always have manners to stand in line, to raise my hand. And those are all great things, but not at the expense of being able to stand up for yourself. Man, that's a powerful finish. Thank you, Morgan. It's been such a privilege for us to have you on today. Thank you. It's been a joy.